Hi, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the 16th Annual Human Rights in Asia Conference hosted by the Human Rights Center at the Uni University of Essex. Um, I'm Genta Suzuki, your presenter for today. I'm currently pursuing my master's degree and MA, Theory and Practice of Human Rights at the University of Essex. It's truly an honor to chair this remarkable conference as we celebrate the 16th year. Nice to meet you all. Um, first of all, I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining today all over the world. Um, your presence adds significant value to this gathering. I extend my gratitude to our speakers, lecturers, the law school event team, and of course the conference organizing committee. Um, so the theme of this conference this year is connecting the thoughts of colonial legacies to modern injustices. So despite that the several decades have passed since the massive waves of decolonization, the legacies of colonization persist until today leaving imbalanced power structures and the marginalization of certain ethnic, religious, or cultural groups in Asia. Today, um, we will explore the remaining impact of colonialism and actions for justice through human rights with um, three activists and our lecture from various regions in Asia. Before starting, I would like to share some topics to keep in mind for everyone today. Next, please. Um, you may ask questions at any timing, but we will collect your qu questions for the speakers to be answered in the Q&A session, which will be on the later half. Please note that we may not be able to pick up all your questions due to time limitations. Um, finally, uh, please kindly communicating, kindly communicate using respectful language. Any aggressive or abusive manner will not be tolerated. Now, um, we would like to start um, with the opening remarks. To officially welcome you to the conference, uh, we, we may start with Dr. Andrew Fagan, who will complete his term as the Director of Human Rights Center this March. Everyone, please welcome Andrew. Jensa, thank you. Yes, um, not too many days left for, for me in this particular role. Um, one, of the, one of the great immense pleasures of being director of the Human Rights Center is the pride that we can rightly take in our students, uh, a passion, a commitment to, to human rights calls, both sort of in terms of scholarship, education, and, and the sort of practical side of human rights too. And one of the key highlights really in our, our students, sort of evidence of our students' passionate commitment is this event. Um, astonishingly, this is the 16th annual conference on Asia and human rights. It's been running for 16 years, which is, you know, we've all, we've all, <laughs> we've all aged somewhat uh, in that period of time. So I am absolutely delighted that once again, our students have come together this year, um, given just how incredibly busy they are, have come together to organize this particular event uh, and then to assemble such a remarkable panel of speakers uh, and to have, I think I'm looking at the participants, 51 participants from, from around the world, I'm sure, which is astonishing. So, so welcome to the event, welcome to the Human Rights Center. We play a, a small role really in supporting this particular event. As I say, almost all of the sort of lifting, heavy lifting is undertaken by the students with the absolutely crucial support of someone I'm going to introduce to you in a moment, who is uh, Dr. Sane Thujita, who has was there at the very beginning, as indeed I think was I, uh, and has played, a, a, again, a crucial role in, in sort of galvanizing, encouraging, occasionally steering, um, with perhaps occasionally a slightly firm hand towards the sort of destination, which is now, which is this particular event. So I'm sure you're going to have a fantastic, uh, fantastic series of sessions. I'm sure you're going to learn. Uh, every year there's a different theme. This theme is connecting the dots of colonial legacies to modern injustice. There's, there's a great deal to, to discuss and to engage with. So without further ado, I am going to pass over to, to Dr. Sane Fujita. Sane, thank you once again for all of the work that you undertake, both on behalf of the Human Rights Center, particularly in Japan, uh, and for this particular event. Okay, everyone, have a fantastic, have a fantastic time. Thank you, Jensa. Thank you to the student organizers. Um, fantastic event, I'm sure. Take care, everyone. See you soon. Bye. Hi. Um, so thank you, um, Dr. Andrew Fagan, for your opening remarks. Um, next, sorry, as uh, Andrew mentioned, uh, we will also have an opening remark from Dr. Sanai Fujita. Sanai is a visiting fellow at the University of Essex and the supervisor of human rights in Asia conference ever, the, ever since the foundation 16 years before. Sanai, I will hand it, be, uh, hand it for you. Thank you, Ikenta, and thank you very much, um, Andrew. Um, i like to um, welcome all the um, participants from different parts of the world, including the, uh, our alumni students. And uh, all speakers, thank you very much for your effort to prepare your um, talk and uh, join us today. 
I know you're so busy. And I also thank you, Human Center, uh, Andrew Fagan, Dr. Fagan, and Jude, and the event team who supported us so much. And also, I thank Professor Colin and Laos, especially for this year's event. And I finally want to congratulate all student event team. You guys work very, very hard. So before we start um, our discussion, I'd like to briefly introduce uh, our uh, conference. Yeah, um, should I introduce? Right. Um, are you seeing my slide? Yes? Yeah. Um, this is a um, student-led event, which was initiated by 16 years ago student from Asia, especially because um, we didn't have a human rights um, in Asia uh, module in, at Essex. Uh, then, although this is a very populated region in the world, and the uh, human rights commitment in Asia is not very strong compared to other regions. So, and the, because we don't have um, a regional mechanism in Asia, so the, it can be very neglected region in the human rights community as well. So, students started um, um, this um, very, in, in the beginning, it was very small um, conference in uh, 2009. And uh, by degree, uh, conference became bigger and bigger. And the students always chose very timely and uh, very interesting topic each year. And uh, uh, we invited very excellent speakers uh, from other countries as well. And uh, since the COVID, uh, we started doing as a um, virtual like we do today. And we continue as a um, uh, Zoom. Uh, style, but in, we can include many speakers from all over the world. That's a benefit as well. So this year, um, this uh, um, our team, these students work so hard. I really congratulate you guys. And this year's topic is about um, post-colonialism. We tend to think about uh, um, uh, in, um, colonialism by Western country, but it's not only the case. So some Asian country also did same thing. Uh, including Japan during World War II and before as well. So today we look at not only Western colonization, but uh, some other Asian country as well. So it's a bit new to, probably new to some of them, but uh, we look forward to hearing from the excellent speaker from other countries. So um, please enjoy the, spe uh, the conference today. And uh, please don't forget, we have a film screen next Thursday. If you are based in Essex, please join us next Thursday as well. Thank you very much. Now, um, we might invite everyone to jump into the discussion of connecting the dots of colonial legacies to modern injustice. Our moderator, um, Professor Colin Sampson, will navigate to. Professor Sampson belongs to the Department of Sociology at the University of Essex. He has extensive research expertise concerning indigenous peoples, human rights, and colonialism. Everyone, please welcome Colin. Thank you very much, Genta, and uh, thank you for all the students who asked me to be part of this conference. I'm very honored to, to do that. Um, in my opening remarks, I'll say a couple of uh, things. I'll just say a little bit about myself and my background, and then I'll uh, say a bit about the, the conference itself and my uh, perceptions of what this is all about. Okay, so I'm a sociologist uh, who works on the borders of anthropology and history. Uh, my main interests are in human rights, colonialism, and cultural diversity. Most of my research for the last 30 years has been with indigenous peoples in North America. And uh, one of the biggest gaps in my knowledge and understanding is about the human rights situation of indigenous and other small peoples in Asia. So um, uh, I, I'm very pleased to be to be part of this and to, for, for the speakers and other people to fill in the many gaps in, in, in my knowledge. But I think there are a few parallels or to use the metaphor of the organizers of the conference connecting the dots. Um, one dot that could be connected is that my entrance into the world of human rights was when I worked on a human rights report for the NGO Survival International. And we, the human rights report was about the people that I subsequently went on to work with for uh, 
since the mid-1990s, and that's the Innu people of northern Canada. And we called the Human Rights Report Canada's Tibet. And I can actually just share you share with you a image of the of the Human Rights uh, Report. Okay, that's it. And the the report was somewhat controversial because of its linking of the situation in Canada to the situation in Tibet. But we felt that there was actually very strong parallels. What one finds, particularly in the north of Canada, is that unilateral confiscation of indigenous land, the erasure of culture through uh, forced uh, assimilation. And um, this may differ from, from China or Tibet, uh, but uh, in the Canadian case, uh, an unfair duplicitous um, land claims process. Uh, but we were actually trying to say that these two instances are quite similar. Uh, the, the main difference is that them, they were more directly violent in Tibet than they were uh, in Canada. And I'll stop sharing that for now. The other uh, parallel or connecting the dots, really, is that I think when we speak about human rights, the central point of conflict is between local or small or indigenous peoples or groups and the nation state, or in some cases, states, and the commercial interests that most states represent. So because the central uh, position of the, uh, because of this central position of the state, all discussions of human rights are necessarily political in nature and require the interrogation of political processes in connection with, and this is where our speakers come in, I think, in connection with the stories of the effects of these political processes, which, as Sunay said, uh, uh, have a colonial dimension. And when we talk about colonialism, we're not just talking about Western uh, colonialism either. We're talking about, in some ways, the colonial processes that are instigated by nation states. Okay, so <clears throat> in terms of this conference, um, I've seen how dedicated the students have been to organizing it. In fact, I think that they started uh, contacting me <laughs> by email in November, and we're now in March. So it's, a, it's been about six months that they have been working on this project. Um, and I'm very honored to be uh, part of that. And I'm also honored to, to see that what they're concerned with is ongoing colonial control of lands, lives, and cultures in one way or another. Um, at universities, students generally learn from researchers and scholars employed by the institutions, and much of their education is academic in nature. This academic education, of course, is very important, and the educational process, ideally, should be a platform for going out into the world and doing things in the world. It should be a platform for action and a platform for thinking about the world, not just as it is, but how the world might be changed. But a truly transformative education is more than sitting in a classroom. What students and teachers like me need to hear are the stories, the ideas, the worldviews, the knowledge of people acting in the world, such as those speaking today, representing West Papuans, Okinawans, Uyghur, and Rohingya. So people who are fighting these injustices and developing strategies to deal with them give us all inspiration and, and hope. And I believe that what, what a human rights activist working on the ground does uh, and says and the stories that they tell are actually invaluable to us. So part of the the, the conference I think I see today is about building alliances, showing that we're not alone in the struggles that we're, we're, we're facing, um, and that any kind of social change, any, any way to address these injustices requires allyship. So for us here at the university, academic study without action is sterile. Academic study without being informed by what people see, hear, and know in specific places on the grounds 
is equally sterile. Finally, as so many uh, governments around the world seem to be in the grip of a kind of authoritarianism bordering on fascism, and so many of these states have imposed drastic cultural transformations on indigenous and other peoples, hearing these stories is absolutely vital. Their cultures, their practices, their beliefs, their languages are all part of the incredible diversity, rich diversity of human knowledge. And we need this, these, this diversity of ways of understanding and knowing in our world more than ever. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin, for your comments. Um, it is also a very valuable opportunity for us students that uh, we directly hear from activists, um, pre precisely frontline human rights defenders. I hope this will be an opportunity to um, share our thoughts and form sort of a solidarity for even if the, our workplaces are all different. So now um, I'm thrilled to introduce our speakers. Um, Unfortunately, our first speaker, um, Dr. Ten Mahu from Myanmar, um, she could she informed that she cannot be with us uh, for the emergency situations. However, um, she has provided a video recording for us, and if time allows, we will play at the last part of our conference. Thank you. So uh, I'll just uh, give a quick introduction for uh, Dr. Tim Maru before moving to the next speaker. So a brief intro. Uh, Maru is a medical doctor and Rohingya feminist from Myanmar. Um, she has dedicated over a decade to initiatives concerning so social cohesion, peace building, women's empowerment, and protection in Myanmar's working states. She has worked for several NGOs and international NGOs, along with the International Rescue Community as a protection lead for Rakhine and Chin. Her own organization, RISA, Southeast and Asian Rohingya Network, has been actively engaged in traditional justice and youth empowerment efforts in Bangladesh and Myanmar. So again, I'm um, I'm very sorry that she cannot be with us together, but uh, we will make sure that her voice will be delivered through the video recordings. Next, please. So for now, uh, we would like to move to the uh, to welcome our next speaker, who is Miss Rod Rodi Wanimbo from West Papua. Rodi is a peace activist in West Papua. She is the chair of the Women's Department of the Evangelical Church of Indonesia. She is a passionate advocate for the liberation of West Papua and the restoration of cultural heritage. She tirelessly speaks up for the rights of women and children affected by conflict between Indonesian forces and West Papua independence fighters. She emphasizes the importance of preserving West Papuan culture and traditions, highlighting the discussion caused by colonialism. Now, I'm delighted to pass the microphone to Rodi for her valuable presentation. Rodi, please. Uh, wah, 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 greetings from the land of West Papua. Wakagak, Navalan Kavalan, Avreniki, Nombomini, Nowogomini. I acknowledge the traditional custodian of Manta land on which I live and work and pay my respect to the elders past, present, and emerging. I highly appreciate this event, uh, uh, student-led initiative of University of Essex. This is, a, this is a, a, a privilege for me to be able to share the pain, the stories of indigenous West Papuan. Before I start with uh, the history of uh, human rights abuses and injustices in West Papua, I would like uh, to show a short uh, video, it's it's about three minutes uh, videos, to hopefully to uh, bring uh, a real situation on the ground in West Papua. And after the video, I will uh, share the history of the injustices. <laughs> Thank you. 
langsung masuk di jenis dengan utara di kampung dengan G2 Aku tengah bungit semua dah, kalau semua main orang itu. Dah, kau mana nuno? Kau tahu kau mana nuno? Kau tengah bau mana? Yok yok leh. Bunga. Mama yang hello. Ibu leh bu ini kan leh. military operation uh, has been uh, started since December uh, 2018 until this year as I'm speaking today that uh, because of the conflict between uh, Indonesian and National uh, Army and police towards the uh, National Liberation Army of West Papua, it was internally displaced first of all. So because of the conflict, it caused internally displaced persons. Uh, in the last six years, uh, it's about 600,000 IDPs it, from the seven different regencies, and especially in the, in the highlands regencies. Uh, for example, in Duga Regency alone, uh, there has been 317 IDPs that died due to the malnutrition and uh, the bad uh, situation in the IDP's temporary shelters. So, uh, yeah, as I'm speaking today, uh, people are still living in the jungle, survive, uh, had been survived with eat the raw leaves, and uh, women have to walk every day four to five hours to the closest river to get the clean water for uh, for the families to make sure that the children and the IDPs at the shelters can can have uh, water and have meal um, meal to survive every day. So it is uh, it is very uh, challenging situation at the moment. We've tried our best uh, from the church or the faith uh, based organization and the other NGOs to do whatever, whatever we can. Uh, uh, so that's the real situation at the moment on the ground. But uh, I will uh, share now the history of the, the injustice that has been happening. So uh, West Papuan, indigenous West Papuan are um, experiencing settler colonialism. And when we talk about settler colonialism, is inseparable from imperial project uh, in global politics. In West Papua context, there are three main historical events which shows uh, the political conspiracy driven by economic interest. First one is New York Agreement. 1962. The New York Agreement was initiated during the Kennedy administration. The purpose of the New York Agreement 
was to facilitate the transfer of power over West Papua from the Netherlands to Indonesia. The agreement made without any consultation or representative of indigenous West Papuan. The US had economic interest in Indonesia since 1920. There were oil and gas companies in Indonesia which owned by the US. Sukarno, the first president of Indonesia, taking advantage of the, of the uh, tense or hatred between the US and Uni Soviet. So Indonesia had supported financially by the Uni Soviet for the military operation called uh, in Indonesia, we call Tri Komando Rakyat, Tri Kora, in order to invade it and took over uh, West Papua in December. 1961. The second uh, historical event is business contract between Freeport McMoran and Indonesia government, 1967. Freeport McMoran, the biggest gold mining company based in US, signed a business contract with Indonesian government to begin uh, with a mining extraction project without any consultation with the Amungme people. Amungme is the landowner of the Mount Nemangkawi. The business contract occurred uh, two years before the United Nations sanctioned process of determining Papua political status in 1969. The third event was called Act of Free Choice. It took place in 1969. What so-called act of free choice held in 1969 was actually for, for indigenous West Papuan, it's act of no choice. Its mechanism was against the international democratic principle of one people, one vote. Instead of organizing a general referendum, only 1,000 26 individuals to be consulted out of approximately 800,000 indigenous Papuan at the time. So 1,026 under the intimidation of the military presence, they decided to be part of Indonesia. Unfortunately, the United Nations rubber stamped the process. This, this is one thing that be, be makes that our struggle is more complicated due to the manipulative process and the result of act of free choice protests were raised and held in various forms at many different places to silence the resistance the indonesian government sent the security forces thousands of indigenous west papuan being killed living as a refugee in Papua New Guinea, the neighboring country of West Papua. Massacre took place in Biak, Wasior, and some other regions in West Papua. Human rights activists were tortured, imprisoned, and killed. Even women were raped by the Indonesian security forces. The greedy of colonizers and the use of the security approach had led to the human rights violation, and especially on the rights of self-determination of indigenous West Pop. I want to uh, share also about uh, systemic racism that uh, we experience. Uh, could you please share uh, the picture? Yeah, uh, this is a picture of Punume. It is a home setting in a community of the Lani, a tribe which I belong to. From generation to generation, West Papua had been living in harmony with the nature and other living creatures. We do have traditional belief system and values. When the colonizer arrived in the land of West Papua, they viewed uh, West Papua as uncivilized, as savage, godless people. 
So I want to uh, just take this paper as an illustration. So, um, so when the when the colonizer arrive on the land of West Papua, they see us as savage. This is a worthless people. This is uncivilized. So they come with the with the civilizing uh, mission, as um, as claimed by some of the. Uh, uh, early Christian missionaries, and uh, we were uprooted from our identity as uh, as Melanesian. Uh, from uh, uh, indigenous West Papuan perspective, we do value our mountain, we do value our ocean, our um, land as our mother. For centuries, um, we believe that the land, the mountain, uh, the oceans ensure the survival of humans and other living creatures. So to us, the extractive um, activities of the Freeport McMoran, later on <clears throat> uh, British Petroleum, as well as the other multinational companies is an action of rape towards our mother. And I do believe that each one of us in this uh, in this uh, webinar, we 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 can do whatever we have to do to protect our mother from being raped. We were uh, forcefully introduced uh, to live in a new type of home without community setting, as our ancestors and grandfathers and grandmothers lived. Our traditional attire, I now uh, wearing my traditional attire, was viewed as a symbol of backwardness. It, it's a symbol of poverty. And um, yeah, we, we were forced to learn uh, certain uh, cultures, dominant cultures. So we grew up feeling inferior. Um, and uh, living in a community which had a serious collective trauma, we were conditioned by the theology teaching also that only focus on uh, personal reconciliation with the creator, um, not with the nature, not with the uh, other living creatures. So this is, um, this is one of the challenging, one of the challenge that we faced also. And uh, the other thing is uh, most of the central government policies are migrant bias. For example, transmigration. Thousands of people from overpopulated city in some other provinces in Indonesia are uh, being brought and settled in the land of West Papua. And according to the state narrative, the purpose of this program is to, to teach indigenous Papuan how to cultivate the land, uh, which is, um, which is quite ridiculous because my ancestors have been uh, ha have the traditional way of uh, agriculture, um, and uh, hundreds of hundreds of forest, um, hundreds hectares of sago. Sago is the stable food for the people in the West Papua and the coastal. Hundreds of hectares of the sago forest were replaced with the oil palm plantation. Um, yeah, and another thing that happening uh, recently in uh, 2019, in August, that indigenous West Papuan students who were studying in Java, in uh, Surabaya and Malang, two of the cities in Java, when they did uh, protest and remembrance of uh, New York agreement in August um, 2019, a uh, few of them facing um, facing racist slur, and uh, it caused intimidation for the university students in their drums. So it it caused almost three thousand indigenous West Papuan decided to come back, uh, came back to West Papua, and. Uh, Recently, last year, the central government forcefully uh, implemented the three new provinces in West Papua, which is not coming from, uh, it's not that inspiration from indigenous Papuans. 
Uh, it is forcefully introduced by the central government. And it is, um, for us, it is, uh, it is a divided and conquer strategy because a province will have a new army barracks, a new police headquarters. It means that the number of the army and police will getting increased and the number of indigenous West Papuan is getting decreased. So uh, yeah, it's like our living space also being taken away uh, with all the policies by the central government. And um, the policies also is my uh, migrant bias policies. So yeah, I would like to um, end uh, this sharing. I want to, I want to share with each one of you that uh, uh, the struggle of indigenous West Papua, and it's not only to have a right of self-determination politically, but our struggle is about protecting our source of life, reclaiming peace and justice, uh, protecting our mother earth. Thank you very much. Wah, wah, wah. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Rodi Wanimbo. Um, I think not many of us have known the, the issues and struggles and the systemic racism of West uh, Papua people face. Um, I know it's a very limited time to share all the information. I hope we can um, ask a little bit more deeper in the following conversation. So thank you very much. Um, nextly, I would like to welcome our Second speaker, Ms. Ai Abe. Ai is a human rights activist, researcher, and writer based in Okinawa, Japan. Okinawa is an archipelago located in the southwest of Japan. Okinawa has a painful history of colonization by Japan and then the United States with the military base of U.S. Army causing severe human rights issues even today. Ai has continuously documented and analyzed Okinawan human rights issues and reported them to the UN human rights bodies. She has also prompted human rights activists and civil society organizations in Okinawa to use international human rights law and the UN human rights system. Um, I is also an Essex graduate with an element degree with in international human rights law. Everyone, please welcome I. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Genta. Um, thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me to the Human Rights in Asia conference. As an alumna of Essex University, I'm honored to be back at the conference as one of the speakers. Let me share my screen. Today, I'm going to talk about Okinawa, Japan's southmost prefecture, consisting of small islands. It is located at the center of a circle connecting mainland Japan, Korea, China, and Taiwan. It was a kingdom of, a kingdom of Ryukyu before the annexation by Japan in 1879. Okinawa was the region affected earliest by the Japanese colonialism, and it is a region where the impact of the Japanese colonialism remained in the form of structural discrimination and it casts a shadow over human rights of its people. Okinawa has had a tutorous history from the 19th to 20th century. Annexation, colonization, militarization by Japan, followed by military colonization by the United States. Let me briefly go through Okinawa's modern history. It was once a nation called Kingdom of Ryukyu, which was annexed by Japan in 1879. King was dethroned at the time, and following the annexation, its languages and culture were banned by the imperialization policy of Japan. While the militarization policy led to the expro expropriation of its land and environmental degradation. At the end of the Pacific War, Japan designated islands of Okinawa as the battlefield between the US, US and the Japanese uh, military. During this battle, appro approximately a quarter of Okinawan people lost their lives. The islands had been 
occupied and placed under the U.S. military control until they were returned to Japan in 1972. During the U.S. military occupation, substantial portion of its territory were taken for the construction of the U.S. military bases. And even after the reversion to Japan, the burden of the U.S. military bases has not decreased. Okinawa Islands has beautiful oceans, rich in the biodiversity and full of coral, as you can see from these pictures. I'm originally from Hiroshima, but have lived in Okinawa for 10 years and witnessed various kinds of and continuous human rights violations. Since time is limited, I'd like to share three examples of major human rights issues, challenges that have arisen just in the last few months. The first one is the destruction of this beautiful ocean. These photos are from Oulo Bay in Henoko, the northern part of the mainland Okinawa. I took these pictures when I went to scuba diving a few years ago and was fascinated by the untouched beauty of Oulo Bay. But the Japanese government has been reclaiming this sea area since 2015 to build a U.S. military base. The people of Okinawa have continuously opposed the reclamation of this bay. They even held a referendum in, in 2019 in which more than 70% of voters expressed their opposition. But the construction work has not stopped. Reclamation of the shadow, shallow area has been completed and now reclamation of the deeper area of Ora Bay was scheduled to begun, begin. Okinawa Prefecture even went to court to resist issuing the reclamation work permit on the Oura Bay side, based on the judgment that the soft ground in parts of Oura Bay made it technically, technically almost impossible to carry out such construction. But the court rejected Okinawa Prefecture's claim and ordered Okinawa Prefecture to issue a permit. When Okinawa Prefecture resisted the, this court order, the government of Japan carried out a substitute execution for the first time in history to issue the permit for the reclamation of the new area on behalf of the prefecture this January. And now, every day, Japanese government is proceeding the reclamation and the construction of the U.S. military base. Here, you can observe the disregard of the right to self-determination and the right to environment of Okinawan people and the neglect of the ethnic principle. The second example is the PFAS contamination of water and soil and the high concentration of PFAS in resident blood as the consequence. PFAS is a chemical which is also called organophroline compound and has been pointed out to increase the risk of cancer and pose a threat to the development of children. In January 2016, the Okinawa Prefecture announced that the high concentration of P4 and P4 had been detected in rivers and other sources of water from the Chatham Water Purification Plant, and that the U.S. Kadena Air Base was presumed to be the source of the contamination. Since the fire extinguishing form used at the U.S. military bases for decades contains those chemicals. The public announcement revealed that 450,000 people in seven municipalities that were supplied with tap water from the Chatham purification plant had been drinking contaminated water without knowing it. Subsequent investigation by Okinawa Prefecture detected high concentration of PFAS in spring water near U.S. Hutema Air Base, Camp Hansen, Camp Foster, and Camp Macturius. And in April 2020, massive leak of fire extinguishing foam containing PFAS occurred from the U.S. Hutema Air Station. This photo is, uh, the photo in the slide is of that accident. Although Okinawa prefectural government have requested the U.S. military and the Japanese government to allow investigation of soil and water on the basis to take measures against contamination, the thorough, investi the thorough investigation has not been conducted. 
due to the status of forces of agreement, such as such investigation requires consent from the U.S. military, and the U.S. military has not provided it so far. So even now, the Japanese government maintains the position that it does not know if the U.S. military bases are sources of the PFAS contamination, which makes it very difficult to seek countermeasures or recognitions of human rights violation. In fact, water intake from the river, which had been temporarily suspended due to the confirmed contamination, began last month due to the drought. Although the adjustment is made so that the level of PFAS in tap water doesn't exceed the government provisional target value, the drinking water that I, I take and people surrounding this area take every day contains PFAS. So here you can observe the failure of the Japanese government to uphold its obligation to protect the Okinawan people's rights to water, environment, health, and information. Also, you can see the U.S. government's failure to respect those rights. Let me go to the third example. Uh, shocking news hit Okinawa this Thursday, and the island is now in a state of rage. The Osprey, as you can see in this picture, a U.S. military transport aircraft, which has been pointed out to be dangerous because of their many malfunctions, had been suspended worldwide after a crash in Japan last November that killed eight crew members. However, this Thursday, Osprey training resumed in Okinawa without any clarification of the cause of the accident or measurement to prevent its reoccurrence. The Japanese government has a policy of not disclosing the cause of the accident or its plan for the operation to the public due to the restriction under the U.S. law. No flight operation has yet been resumed in other parts of Japan where there is opposition. And I think this is another example of the dangers being forced upon Okinawan people disproportionately and discriminatingly. This case again reveals that the Japanese government treats the anger of Okinawan people more lightly than the anger of people in other parts of Japan. You can observe the Japanese government's failure to protect the right to information of Okinawan people as well. So what all these cases have in common is that these human rights violations originate from the U.S. military bases and that the Japanese government has neglected or even perpetuated these human rights violations. In short, behind this human rights violation is the militarization of Okinawa by the U.S. and Japan. About 70% of the facilities and areas designated for the exclusive use of U.S. forces in Japan are concentrated in Okinawa, which accounts for only about 0.6% of Japan's land area. Also, rapid deployment of Japan's self-defense forces is proceeding in Okinawa's smaller and remote island. The photo of this slide shows the self-defense forces training in Yonaguni Island, which is an island just 224 kilometers away from Taiwan. The Japanese government explains the, that Okinawa is strategically important because of this geographical characteristic, its proximity to the Korean Peninsula and the Taiwan Strait, and that militarization is necessary for its national security. However, Historical rather than geopolitical reasons are more re reasonable explanation for the disproportionate militarization of Okinawa. In 2006, Dudu Dien, the then UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Form of Racism, referred to the people of Okinawa as discriminated minority 
in his report after an official visit to Japan. He stated, investigation is needed to determine whether the continued existence of the U.S. military bases in Okinawa is compatible with the respect of the fundamental human rights of the people of Okinawa. So what are the challenges to address the human rights violations of Okinawa? Of course, there are many, many factors, but because of the uh, time limitation, I would like to highlight the lack of understanding of historical context. It leads to the ignorance and cynicism towards Okinawan's people's human rights claim, which leads to the invisibilization and reinforcement of the structural discrimination. This attitude can be seen in the remarks of the key government officials, for example. Uh, the, the man in this photo on the left side is the former chief cabinet secretary, Suga. He held an intensive talks with the governor of Okinawa over the Henoko landfill issue in 2015. In this uh, intensive talk, in response to the governor's, Okinawan governor's repeated references to Okinawan history and his call for no further burden of the base, Suga said, I was born after the war, so it's far hard for me to understand the history of Okinawa. This kind of ignorance really um, re reinforced the discrimination towards Okinawan people. On the other hand, lack of education of history to Okinawan children also impacts the collective identity of Okinawan people, which may be an obstacle when they want to claim their rights as Okinawan people or and indigenous people. The Okinawan people, however, have raised their voices about their human rights violations through the UN human rights mechanism, including EMIRIP and treaty bodies and special, special procedures seeking redress. While domestic laws continue to fail to provide recognition and re redress, the recommendations and communication coming out of these agencies give the Okinawan people the perspective that their complaints are legitimate and that the current situation is unjust and leading to empowerment. Finally, I would like to end my presentation by sharing with you a part of the oral statement at the Human Rights Council made by Okinawa governor, uh, the then Okinawa governor, Onaga Takeshi, who fought the Japanese government fiercely and died in the middle of his fight in 2018. I'll quote, over the past 70 years, U.S. bases have caused many incidents, accidents, and environmental problems in Okinawa. Our right to self-determination and human rights have been neglected. Can a country share values such as freedom, equality, human rights, and democracy with other nations when that country cannot guarantee those values for its own people? I think his righteous but unanswered question deserve answers by the government of Japan. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have more questions and if you have interest, uh, please contact me. And if you have more interest in the right to self-determination of the Okinawan people, you can find my article here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ai, for your eye-opening um, presentations. Um, it, I, it was very good that you clearly addressed what kind of human rights uh, violations that the Okinawan people face and how you're trying to connect with the UN system. I, I'm pretty sure there's um, questions from the audience that we can um, take in later. So thank you very much. Um, so for the third, last but not least speaker, I would like to introduce Ms. Mrs. Maria Aiseva. Sorry, Myra Aiseva. Um, Myra is an activist and chair of the UK Uyghur community since 2021. 
Uyghur people who are located in Xinjiang, China, has been facing severe oppression and internal colonization by the Chinese government. She, um, volunt she, her work focuses on lobbying and raising awareness on the mass atrocities concerning the Uy Uyghur community. While participating in a variety of campaigns and demonstrations, she has been working on sharing experience with communities and organizing cultural events for the Uyghur community. Myra, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Genta, um, Genta uh, for inviting me to um, this panel. And I've got privilege to be amongst with um, the professors and the speakers. And thank you to all the organizers who helped me to uh, sign in and be on this platform. So my name is Myra. I'm Uyghur, and uh, I was born in exile. Um, and my dad, so he was born in Turkestan. And in 1955, so he had to flat the region uh, with his family um, to Russia and then from Russia to Central Asia, where they settled. So it's uh, actually been a plan between um, the Soviet Union and the Chinese Communist Party, I will shortly call it CCP, um, when uh, the CCP invaded uh, the East Turkestan in 1949. So um, the East Turkestan is a region which, as uh, Genta mentioned, it's now called uh, Xinjiang, which means uh, a new territory, and uh, it was named in uh, 1955. Um, so from 1949, when the CCP um, occupied the region. So, uh, uh, sorry, before that, uh, the East Turkestan um, had twice independent in 1933 and uh, in 1944. Uh, however, after uh, being dissolved in uh, 1949, uh, so it lose, uh, lost all the controls and then when the CCP actually took the opportunity and um, occupied the land. So since that uh, time, so for decades, for over 70 years, uh, so the region um, has faced um, oppression. Uh, it's been, um, so oppression amongst the revolutions, the massacres happen on the land because Uyghurs uh, and other um, minorities, they've been resisted to the um, um, brutal Chinese um, Communist Party regime. Um, this um, escalated and the situation severely changed in 2015. And uh, in 2014, when the um, former Chinese, um, he wasn't former at that time, but uh, Communist Party Secretary uh, Chen Guanggo uh, visited um, East Turkestan in 2014. He actually was um, uh, a, um, the person who um, changed the... Um, to, to, so he was um, uh, the person who uh, changed the Tibet, I mean, the rules in Tibet. And um, so when he came to East Turkestan in 2014, so he noticed that uh, since 1949, the occupation time, so it's a little changed in East Turkestan. So people, uh, Uyghur people and other minorities, they've been living happily and uh, they've been, um, uh, the country, I mean, the region was developing. Uh, Uyghur people were good at trading so we've been going outside, um, bringing resources uh, to the land. So, and we uh, just were free. And then uh, it's uh, dramatically changed when in 2015, uh, so the uh, government, Chinese government, uh, passes controversial uh, counter-terrorism law um, to further legitimize it's a uh, suppression of uh, expressions of Turkic and Islamic identity in East Turkestan. 
So what's been happening is that Uyghurs and other Turkic minorities, I mean, we are Muslims, uh, so we, uh, many of us wearing, back home was wearing hijabs, um, men with beard going to the mosques. And um, so what they did, they've come up with a policy of 52 pages where they um, uh, said that this region has to change because of this new uh, legislation. And um, so uh, Uyghur people have been subject to um, change their appearance. Uh, women on the street um, were caught and asked to cut their uh, long skirts or dresses because um, uh, on the new law it's not longer allowed. So men were forced to shave their beard and then uh, there was about 48 uh, listed crimes uh, for uh, Uyghurs is, um, uh, such as uh, being beard, wearing hijab, uh, praying uh, five times, going to mosque, um, fasting. So all this uh, is part of the um, crimes that um, the Chinese government uh, were taking as reasons. And for um, so when they start, um, so for decades actually, the uh, Chinese government been building concentration camps. Um, so in the region, but in the rural areas. So and then when they start um, using these rules um, and crimes against um, um, Uyghur people and other minorities, so they start locking people in concentration camps and prisons. So and then uh, from 2016, the mass um, um, project of building more concentration camps uh, in cities, big cities, uh, an entire region. So been planned and they, they started doing it. Uh, so by 2018-19, so the satellite images show that the graveyards have been demolished uh, and on their places the many um, incapacity of um, hundreds of thousands. Um, so the, the concentration camps have been built. So Uyghur people and other minorities like Kazakhs, Kyrgyz and Tatars, they've been taken um, to concentration camps, uh, interrogated, tortured, killed, systematically, uh, women been systematically raped, uh, sterilized. Um, and um, so from the uh, current leakage, so the document leakage, uh, so there, there was... Um, from Xinjiang, uh, a particular prison, a uh, concentration camp. So it was found that about 5,000 people, uh, people's uh, data was found with the pictures, with names, the region they were born, and uh, the age, ra age range was between 15 to 75. So um, for, since 2016, so what they've been trying to lock the scholars, um, uh, people, uh, so businessmen, um, and whoever wasn't abiding with the, the new rules. So they were trying to, <clears throat> they've been trying to, uh, first of all, uh, to uh, make sure that Uyghurs are, um, Uyghurs were, um, Kind of admit that they've been committing those crimes uh, and then to establish a portfolio of, uh, you know, so the, the, what they've been uh, saying about legitimizing that uh, suppression and expression of Turkish Islamic identity, so and uh, calling it counter extremism. So they're trying to show that this is happening, these uh, people are uh, extremists, terrorists. And uh, that's how they show us to the world. Um, later, when um, so the mass detention uh, happened, so the um, <clears throat> Uyghur people um, were not, I mean, still not allowed to go outside. So since 2016, um, um, identity, so ident like ID cards, passports were taken away. 
And what the authority says is that uh, it's stored somewhere. And if you would like to go outside, so you have to prove that you don't have any connection to the, any extremist um, uh, parties or groups outside. Um, but this is uh, obviously a lie. Uh, nobody was uh, allowed to go since. And uh, moreover, we don't have an access to uh, our families because um, so the uh, phone numbers, uh, any type of communication were cut. Um, so uh, and even some families been located from um, uh, their uh, original um, places to either mainland China or somewhere else or the entire family are in concentration camps. So um, many people, they don't know what's happening to their uh, so relatives and family. Uh, however, uh, at some point, they allow to use WeChat, uh, which is uh, similar to Instagram. And um, so, but however, that's be, been monitored throughout the years, even if we always are using it, so they can't express themselves as, um, so saying even uh, Assalamu alaikum or uh just uh, name allah so to say that uh, do any prayers so they have to be very sharp short in their conversations and just to say just to see that you know the family is there they are fine um amongst with that they got a civilian state uh in investment more than 60 million dollars so they invested in the region and there's the hickwinson uh huawei particular participating in that, where they uh, monitor Uyghurs uh, in the region. <clears throat> They've, um, so the entire region, so in 2018, there was a, a Russian YouTuber went uh, to the region and they showed how much cameras, so on the street and around the particular buildings. And even to enter your uh, home, the building, the estate, so you have to go for the security face recognition program. So uh, you've given your uh, DNAs, uh, fingerprints, and um, even your relatives are restricted to go in. And each uh, home is fitted with a camera at the entrance. So you are not free in your house. So you're, they know how, when you're going out, when you're coming in. And um, so that's been monitored. And also, uh, if you're walking on a street, <clears throat> I think there's been new just a couple of years uh, when they um, um, build a system that recognizes your, um, even uh, measures your um, uh, anxiety. So if you're walking and your temperature, they measure your temperature and by uh, measuring it, they know uh, the level of your anxiety. So if your anxiety is high for any reason, so they're going to pull you out uh, to the nearest police station and they're going to uh, interrogate you. Saying what was the reason for your anxiety? Why you feel anxious? Is there something to hide? You have to share, you have to disclose. So, and that pressure uh, has been happening. So even being outside, uh, so Uyghur people and other minorities are not uh, feeling uh, free because they're all been um, uh, monitored and followed. Um, so until last year, I think, so uh, not many people were able to enter uh, the region. Um, however, in 2000, and, uh, was it 21 or 22? So they allowed some, uh, what they call uh, tourists uh, from particular um, countries to visit Esterkistan and uh, to see that, you know, the region is, uh, there's nothing happening in the region. Uh, everyone um, lives uh, happily, lives happily. So, and what it shows in some footage is that we all people are dancing on the street, um, you know, the, the food bazaars and uh, the, um, um, traditional clothing being presented, musicians, uh, all that is exist. However, that's not true. The people are dancing on the street that are Chinese people, 
So we, we can identify them from their faces and um, either they've been forced or voluntarily. Um, so they do it, we, we don't know, because in our culture, we don't dance on uh, the squares on the street unless it's a, a festival, uh, unless it's a big event. So this is number one. And uh, uh, in terms of mosques, they destroyed about 16,000 mosques in the region. And they just left a couple of big mosques for these tourists to come and see that they exist. Uh, many of our big mosques have been converted into pubs. Um, and uh, during Ramadan, um, so uh, Uyghur people are forced to drink alcohol. Um, and uh, they, um, they're organizing events such as the drink competition. And even the women involved, so they have to go on a stage uh, and drink alcohol and show how much they can drink. Um, so this has been uh, going on for years. And even the light in your uh, house, if it's switched on uh, around four o'clock in the morning, so they know that you're definitely uh, still comply with, uh, you know, uh, your religion. So your it's a time to wake up uh, for the morning prayers. And so, so they just can go in and um, uh, arrest you and take you to the camp. So uh, this has been uh, going on uh, since 2016. Um, however, so the occupation of the land, as I said, that's been from 1949. And uh, uh, so... Also, with regard to uh, population, so uh, in 2015, um, so the um, Chinese government uh, uh, said that about 13 and a half million of Uyghurs uh, living in the region. Uh, it's not true. There's about 35 to 40 million Uyghurs living in the region. So they just uh, um, the the information about the census uh, on Uyghur population um, just was lost. So I, I think it's um, so it's been done on purpose. So for the researchers of anyone to find the original information, but we know it's more than 30 million uh, Uyghurs in the region. Uh, about more than 3 um, million Uyghurs are in concentration camps. Um, so the concentration camps, first of all, they've been subject to interrogation. I mean, it's still, but it was severely at the beginning. Uh, but now, when you go into concentration camp, they call it the re-education camps. So you uh, go there and you have to learn a new um, profession. Um, the, first of all, language, uh, because we speak uh, Uyghur language and we write in Arabic. Um, but uh, now, so the Chinese um, government, everyone, so has to learn the first of all a uh, language from. It doesn't matter your age; everyone is forced. And uh, uh, once you're in concentration camp, so you have to learn uh, uh, a profession, and then you are sent to a particular camp for a labor. So the Uyghur slave labor. Uh, been one of the topics that uh, many researchers and academics have been talking around about, um, so especially on um, Kutun, East Turkestan, Kutun, which is 60% um, of uh, Chinese cotton, and uh, in the world, is a 20% uh, of cotton, uh, East Turkestan cotton used in the world. So um, then many Uyghurs have been sent to the um, mainland China, again, as a slave laborers. There's a mass, this footage again showed the mass um, so transfer from the region to uh, uh, inner China. Uh, and then, so um, we don't know if those people been back or not. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we just didn't hear, we can't uh, hear because there is no resources. We don't have an access. To that information uh, but we know that many people die in concentration camps because of the illnesses so uh, if you are uh, identified as a strong 
and um, person and be able to work as a slave labor. So they will leave you for, for that work. Uh, but if not, so they will give you a certain uh, medication and um, they, you're going to be injected with uh, some sort of diseases. And after your release from the concentration camp, so you wouldn't allow to go to the, your doctor uh, for the next six months. So that period actually is given to, to so they know that the disease that they've infected you with um, so will develop within that period and you will die. So this, uh, uh, again, there are so many uh, videos of that and um, interviews being given by family members who, um, of whose uh, died um, from being released, after being released from concentration camps and from certain diseases. So people in a couple of months just being looked by like a dried vegetable. Uh, you can't even just tell as a human. Um, and uh, one of the um, examples that my friend been experienced is that when her brother was in concentration camp, so for, and despite being a different citizen, a diff citizen of a different country, so he was given a pill for five days. Once he was released and went back to the country, uh, diff and, uh, the country of uh, residence. So uh, after two months, he was diagnosed with cancer. So he was treated and after two years, he was cleaned. And the doctors in that country confirmed that that was artificially infected um, cancer, injected cancer. And after uh, two years, so there was, it's, he died from stroke. So they know if, uh, if the one thing doesn't work, another thing so literally will be working and it should work. That's how they know um, the process of diseases uh, developing in a human body. Uh, so the uh, inside the, uh, the concentration camps, uh, they've got uh, laboratories of uh, different sort of, uh, uh, types where people are taken. Uh, again, for um, another thing that was um, the research is the organ harvesting. So if you're a healthy person, so you will be taken uh, to that particular medical uh, department uh, to be examined. So your blood will be taken every week uh, and then so you will be fed well. Uh, and once they've got a matching uh, request for your particular organ, so you're just going to be killed. Uh, so many people just life being <clears throat> killed while they've been, you know, alive. And um, also they've uh, constructed crematoriums where they just, after taking a body, I mean, after taking on organs, they just been uh, using crematoriums to just to, to get rid of uh, the bodies. That's why there is no number uh, how many Uyghurs or other minorities died in East Turkestan so far. Uh, but there's been um, <clears throat> uh, the, the organ harvesting issue uh, came up when the um, requests from the Muslim countries increased. And because what the promotion of uh, um, Uyghurs or organs was um, promoted as halal organs, because at that time we uh, didn't drink and, uh, and didn't smoke. So, and then when the request for uh, increased from Muslim countries, that were the concerns uh, started raising about the world's organs uh, in the region. And uh, I think they China entirely known for the organ harvesting. Um, but yeah, but in, in, so it was regard to the Uyghurs, and uh, that was the um, <clears throat> and it's happening, it's still happening, but we don't know on um, scale how much and how severe. Um, sorry, so we'll, sorry to interrupt just a second. Um, as we're the time is a little bit pushing, I would be really happy if we could move to the closing. Yeah. And <laughs> if, if, um, people, yeah, I mean, there, I know there's much to say, so we can, um, address that in the QA part. Sorry, thank you. 
Sure. Thank you very much, Ginta. Yes, so um, it's so much to share, um, I know, but if we look at the colonialism, um, we know, so we look at the uh, occupation, settling and uh, exporting the land, of the, so it's economically. So um, the occupation happened since 1949, so the settling been uh, for years, but the mass settling been uh, from 2016, uh, when the Chinese government um, either voluntarily or uh, forcibly uh, been trying to bring their um, officials from the mainland. And according to the research, it's now about 7 million uh, Chinese people living in the land since 2000, uh, sorry, in the region since 2017. And exploiting it economically, yes, uh, the region being used, the resources of the region being used for uh, decades. Um, it's um, uh, so biological resources, land, petroleum, natural gas, gold, silver, coal, uranium. So uh, gas and oil reserves and 40% of coal reserves in Turkestan being used um, uh, by uh, CCP uh, and a solar panel uh, also about 80% of the solar, pa solar panels are now um, are mined in, I mean, the, the, this uh, raw material are mined in this Turkestan, so which is also concerned, the slave labour, so the land, the occupation shows that the, uh, the, the region been a colony uh, for, for, for the China and it's um, because it's in itself, it's been a separate country uh, with people of different appearance, traditions, culture, um, so language uh, and heritage. I think I, I should stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Myra. Um, it, it is uh, very, sometimes hard to like hear the re reality of what the Uyghur community is facing. And I really respect your hard work um, trying to address this issue. So um, for now, um, I would like to thank um, all three speakers for your strong and eye-opening speeches. I think they have been very insightful into the realities of colonial legacy in Asia. So now uh, we're Happy to move to the discussion and Q&A session to go even further into the discussion with all three speakers and our moderator, Colin Sampson. At this point, uh, please feel, and we've already been receiving some questions, but please, please, please feel free to use the um, Q&A um, function, function to ask questions, questions you may have in the chat. chat. So, so, sorry, we're, we're grateful, grateful to have, have Professor, Professor Colin Sampson from, from Department of Sociology as a moderator for the discussion, and the all speakers are back. Okay, I'll, I'll give the microphone to you, Colin. Great, thank you very much. And, and I echo Genta's words about the speakers. They were all incredibly moving and interesting and eye-opening. And uh, what you had to say really deserves to be heard widely. Um, I'll just say a couple of things to, to summarize. I think there was some commonalities in all three uh, presentations. One was that you've exposed the um, flaws or the actually the, the, the phoniness of decolonization, especially in the case of West Papua, but but also Okinawa and and uh, um, East Turkestan as well in that what we actually see happening is that one state simply hands over power to another. It's most evident in, in West Papua. And I believe that that was made um, illegal in 1975 in the Western Sahara case, whereby uh, Spain handed over its colony in the Western Sahara to Morocco and Mauritania. This is completely illegal. Um, but th this, is, this is the situation in many parts of the world, even if you looked at Australia and Canada, the British handed over to their own settlers. <laughs> they, did, they didn't hand over to the indigenous people of those uh, territories. 
Um, and then also um, we're, we're, we're talking about annexation. And I think annexation is a very neglected topic in human rights, and it should be uh, uh, spoken about much more because it's, it's widely practiced by na nation states. Another commonality between the speakers is the experience of forced assimilation. It's particularly brutal uh, with the Uyghurs, but it's particularly brutal everywhere, I think, uh, in, in, in different ways. And that manifests itself in the erasure of local cultures and in the inferiorization of, of uh, lo local uh, cultures and most perniciously in the attempt to re-educate uh, indigenous uh, groups or colonized groups in the worldview of the, the, the dominant group. And then I think another uh, commonality is this is this concept I think Rode mentioned at first of transmigration by which the colonial state enables other people uh, to, to settle and to colonize uh, the lands of uh, indigenous people and what we heard at the end um, is uh, in a way a confirmation of what I said at the beginning what I said at the beginning was that you know we're, we're living in the group of uh, an authoritarianism around the world that borders on fascism. And what I've been he hearing is that there's very little um, dividing line between the fascism that we knew of the past in the 1920s and the 1930s and, and the stories that you you, you told. So um, thank you very much. And I think it's really important that these stories are told. I'll now go to the Q and A. Uh, the first one is from Zainab, um, which actually I have here somewhere. Whoops. Okay, so yeah. Okay, uh, Zainab is an MA in Migration Studies, and her question is to Rode. Uh, she thanks you for your presentation, and oh, actually, you've already answered it. <laughs> I see. You're going to share, so. Uh, but I'll share the question. Okay. So it's uh, she thanks you of her presentation and uh, uh, t says that you mentioned that Papuan pe West Papuan people were thought uh, were made to think that they were inferior, and we wondered she wondered how you think this has affected their identity and whether it maybe had uh, um, the opposite effect of the authorities. That is, that it was a catalyst to conserving culture and reaffirming collective identity. So maybe we'll start with that question. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for uh, the question. And thank you very much, Colin, for um, summarize and bring the very important point. Um, I'm sorry, my I need to charge. Oh, yeah. Um, yes, I think uh, I personally experience, I grew up feeling inferior. And I'm struggling um, uh, because I'm. Uh, we have 250 languages, tribe and languages. So I grew up uh, feeling inferior because I cannot speak uh, Indonesia as a national language. So in schools, in formal schools, we it, it's a compulsory subject. We have to speak Indonesia. So when we are not uh, good enough uh, to speak Indonesia, we were viewed as um, yeah, yeah as uncivilized. So we grew up feeling inferior, and also we kind of not we we are feeling ashamed to wearing our traditional attire. So um, yeah, I we 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 grew up not having a healthy self image. That's that's based on my own experience. So. Um, when I was in university, I realized that um, I I have to make change for myself. So I decided to have uh, to wearing my traditional attire in in a in a special occasion, for example, uh, in a public uh, space, so that uh, it's it's a it's like an action. And also I want to inspire the younger generation of West Papua and that we, we, 
we are a human being, we are equal with others, even though we look different, but we are equal. So um, yeah, maybe that's that's a uh, example that I uh, can uh, answer your question. Thank you very much, uh, Rode. The second question is from Martha Lewis, who's a LLM student in international human rights law. And her question is directed to Myra. Um, she asks, um, what was the effect, if any, of the uh, Office of uh, Human Rights report in 2022 on Xin Xinjiang, which is interesting, which is the colonial name um, of East Turkestan, which we found out today, and which actually I did I wasn't aware of that. Um, so, uh, so what was the effect of this uh, uh, UN report? So uh, I believe <clears throat> the effect was uh, is just to um, uh, attract some attention of, as I mentioned earlier, some advisors uh, to, to come to the region and, and check what's been happening. Uh, but uh, what we've been demanding certain NGOs and uh, um, the countries that support us, they've been demanding for, for the independent advisors to go into the region and uh, um, so do their own research uh, and see what is really been happening. Uh, but those who've been sent or invited by uh, the Chinese government, so later they just feed back that so nothing has been happening. So nothing is that the region is um, uh, entirely, you know, down to Uyghurs and uh, no one feel oppressed and even some uh, sorts of... Um, Interviews been taken where we were under pressure, so we're giving, saying, "Oh yes, you know, we are happily living in the region, so we are, uh, you know, uh, thanks to the government who takes takes care of us." Um, yeah, so it, it wasn't helpful at all. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Paul who's a professor in the law department and, and also in the Human Rights Center. Um, his, he asks if any of the oppressed people that we've heard about today have any significant political support from any other country or state. So I guess that's addressed to, to all of you. Uh, maybe I can start. Uh, uh, West Papua struggled for having a self-determination politically. We were really supported from uh, Vanuatu, is a country in the Pacific. So um, I'm going to go next. Um, so Okinawa Prefecture Government set on policy of promoting its own regional diplomacy. And recently the governor of Okinawa visited, for example, Taiwan or Philippines and China and also Guam and tried to establish a connection with those regions and countries. But I don't think I, I don't think that there has been a support, political support by those states. I don't apologize. May I ask for a repetition of question of this question? Yeah, the question is whether uh, the Uyghurs, for example, have had any political support from any other state. Uh, yes, I mean, we, the United States, um, so they've um, <clears throat> been supporting us by uh, even um, introducing uh, the issue to um uh, to the level that where there's some acts like uh, labor or labor acts um, uh, were passed um, uh, by the government, and they um, and they strongly um, you know agree on the statement that the Chinese government uh, has been committing genocide in the region and crimes against humanity. So uh, the independent tribunal, Euro tribunal, which took place in London. Um, also determined that uh, the genocide had been happening in the region and um, so 
<clears throat> the the crimes against humanity uh, that China was committing, the Chinese government. Um, and then after the tribunal verdict, um, several countries, uh, so in Europe, um, so they've um, shown the support. Uh, and now in the UN, um, countries uh, like Czech Republic, uh, uh, Lithuania, uh, even Kosovo, Somalia, so they um, are supporting us. And the president of the World Congress, uh, Dolkonisa, so he's been establishing some uh, partnership with certain governments. So he goes into a particular country, uh, and even here, for example, we've got the group, uh, the IPAC, the Interparliamentarian, um, so group on Uyghur issue and Tibetan, for example. Um, in Dublin, uh, so the same uh, group established uh, in certain governments in Germany. So the right groups in the parliament who works on the Uyghur issue are uh, exist. Thank you. Uh, Myra, there's a, a follow-up question from Lars Waldorf, uh, who is a member of the law department in Essex University. He asks um, if you could say a few words about the impact of the Uyghur Tribunal. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, as just mentioned, so the Uyghur Tribunal was established uh, in 2021. 20, um, so for uh, over the year, so it's by the um, uh, KC Jeffrey Nice. Um, so he um, brought to the panel um, uh, independent judges uh, and um, so behind the scene many researchers were worked on this tribunal and um, <clears throat> uh, thousands of documents been presented by the Uyghurs across the world who have uh, access uh, to um, some documents and information on what's been happening in their families back home. So all this has been gathered and once the verdict was um, uh, made on and decision, and the verdict that the China was uh, committing suicide, oh, sorry, a genocide and crimes against humanity. So um, our cause has uh, a more attention. Um, so we definitely were given more attention since, even in the media. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, parliaments of different countries started working with us. Um, NGOs and the issues taken. So we, the, the lobbying itself has changed for us, the way that we've been doing it. So many groups been advising us um, and um, we, we managed to, <clears throat> but we've been, what we've been doing since is that we've been trying uh, for certain, so for, for certain governments to take actions, legal actions, um, you know, sanction, Chinese uh, officials uh, and uh, issue some particular law that would help Uyghurs uh, in general. Thank you, Myra. Myra, <clears throat> I'll uh, go on to Gulberg. There's also another uh, question from Zainab, but she's already asked one. So <laughs> I'll skip to Gulberg and then come back to Zainab. And her question is for Rode. And she asks uh, if Rode could explain what re-education is and how education can be used as a tool of assimilation, alienation, and dehumanization. Uh, what kinds of policies have been implemented by the Indonesian colonizers for re-education? Uh, we, heard, we heard about that in great detail from Moira. So I think she's asking if you can tell us a little bit more about this uh, force, what I would call forced assimilation uh, process. How does that actually work? Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm. To be honest, I'm in the process of uh, improving my academic English, so I'm really sorry if I uh, not using. Um, if I'm using in 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 inappropriate words, um, yeah. For example, in West Papua context, um, like, can you imagine that we have 250 tribes and languages, but uh, we have to learn uh, 
uh, the Indonesia as a national language and also the history. We, uh, we were not allowed to learn about our own history um, when, when the Indonesia took over West Papua in 1963. Uh, all of the document about indigenous West Papuan that being documented by the Dutch at the earlier, um, it were uh, burned out. So we don't have any documentation. So like all the histories is being told orally by our grand grandparents and, and uh, that's how we have to learn. Even we, even we have to memorize all the names of the river in, in Java, in other provinces, the, the, the national heroes, and we don't have to, uh, yeah, <laughs> learn about our heroes. So that's maybe the concrete examples, and also um, uh, the the local the local wisdom, the the indigenous wisdom. It's not accommodated in the syllables or curriculum in in West Papua, even though we have special autonomy but it's it's not we are not given authority to make our own syllabus sorry if i not answering your question <laughs> no rode you're perfectly clear um in what you say uh, i just had a point of clarification on what you did say there about burning the documents are you saying that the dutch when they decolonized they burned a lot of the colonial documents that they destroyed yes. them? Uh, no, when the Indonesia took over West Papua, when the Dutch left, so all the documentation in in the in the office of the arts in Jayapura were burned down. So yeah. And that was deliberate. Right. Okay. Yeah, interesting. One of the a common colonial mm -hmm. process that was um, implemented by Britain, Belgium, um, and other countries was to destroy the documents when they left. Uh, so there would be very few records of the atrocities that they, they caused. In Britain, it was called Operation Legacy. So they were, they were very concerned about the, uh, the, their reputation after the ending of colonialism. So it sounds like something similar. It's happening there with a so-called post-colonial state. Okay, so Zainab, um, Zainab's question is for Myra again, and she's asking whether Uyghurs have any um, claim to asylum in Western countries, such as the UK or EU countries, and is the persecution of the Uyghurs being recognized as a firm basis for asylum? In, in these countries? Thank you for the question. <clears throat> um, yes, yeah, so since um, in the UK historically, um, the asylum seekers, um, are, although not many, uh, from early 2000s, um, it's again those who were <clears throat> participating in um, Tiananmen Square and, and in the massacres. Um, in 2009 and 1997. So, um, but just a few of yours. However, since 2016, um, so we've, um, uh, we've been recording um, Uyghurs coming from, not directly from Turkestan, but from different countries such as Turkey, um, uh, some Arab countries, um, Egypt, I mean, <clears throat> Uyghurs in Egypt got quite, um, they are in quite a difficult situation because there was an order of the Chinese government to lock Uyghurs um, in Egypt and uh, so then um, sent back to China uh, and that uh, would be a, a sort of uh, um, a crime that the China would <laughs> To take uh, as a reason uh, being in that country, uh, uh, so uh, you know, for uh, especially religious studies. So many Uyghurs in Egypt or Malaysia, uh, on Turkey, they uh, um, 
in early uh, late 90s early 2000s they were going for that purpose uh, to study religion <clears throat> to become imams and go back so um yeah in turkey uh again so the civilian state um uh, and china's uh, um input on civilian state in turkey is quite high so um Uyghurs, uh, about 60 to 70,000 Uyghurs living in Turkey. Uh, and um, so some of them uh, are monitored and um, many uh, Uyghurs have been sent back to the region um, because of the CCP's orders. Uh, and uh, here, oh, we don't have many refugees here. I mean, families and singles would do, which would support, who would support uh, but the largest uh, uh, amount being in a couple of other countries like uh, Norway, um, um, Sweden, um, Germany. We do have uh, refugees there. And uh, just one thing to add. Uh, so the Canadian government, um, so they've approved the bill on having 10,000 euros uh, to Canada. So, and they're going to spend about $350 million to transfer those people. So now it's, um, they are in the process to um, uh, go through the application of more than 30,000 applications from Uyghurs around the world. Uh, but they've been uh, taking on those who are in a very critical situation with no documents, no status in that country. Um, so, and then once they all settled and uh, all the fit and um, so everything is set up for them to move to Canada. So they're going to start that process soon. Excellent. Thank you very much. So um, were you actually saying that states like Egypt and Turkey co cooperate with the CCP in returning Uyghurs to, uh, to their fate, whatever that might be? Yes, absolutely. There was uh, uh, the few orders given to those countries uh, because I mean here we've got uh, families who got friends um, uh, in Egypt, so literally been living without any documentation or expired visas for years, and uh, so they're not allowed to go outside. They can't go outside because uh, so if they caught by the police, so it's. Um, for sure they, they're going to be sent back uh, to the region and they have to for years uh, stick to different communities those communities you know helping with the food clothes about that's kind of settings they they've been living for years um yeah yeah okay thank you um moira so uh I think this probably we're near, nearing the end now, so this might be the last question. Mm -hmm. So this is for I. Uh, in terms of the UN systems, what are some further expectations you have of the, the global human rights movement in Okinawa? And uh, that's one question. There's a second like follow-up question for you. What would you suggest the education system include to expand the collective identity of Okinawan children? Thank you very much. Um, uh, for the first question, it um, mm, I would say, okay, I think Okinawan people and civil society organization has utilized UN human rights system very actively in the past decade. But uh, so even, however, even if those Okinawan civil society organization um, communication and reporting resulted in some kind of recommendation by the treaty bodies or special rapporteurs, those recommendations and communications uh, have been treated very lightly by the government of Japan. Thus, it doesn't bring much effect on promoting and promoting the human rights and of Okinawan people. So if there is any kind of, for example, the UN agencies and between the UN agencies and the Japanese government to have a close dialogue. 
um, so that the Japanese government can understand the importance of um, implementing the recommendation and respecting those recommendations by the UN human rights uh, human rights system, that would be that would have much effect on the promotion of the human rights of Okinawan people in reality. And another thing, and the second question, um, actually there are many recommendations by the treaty bodies to include historical and language education in the public education curriculum in public school, in, especially in Okinawan history and language. Uh, I think maintaining languages is a key to preserve a culture and also to um, nurture the sense of collective identity. Uh, however, uh, there are some some classes of the languages educa languages education in elementary school, and materials uh, have been provided by the Okinawan uh, prefectural government, but it is really not enough. So younger generation do not speak uh, Okinawan languages uh, very often. They uh, they have some difficulty understanding the languages of elder people. So really the language and historical education must be implemented in public school more strongly. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, I agree with that. One of the things that I've uh, observed in some of my research is activities by indigenous people in the field of cultural revitalization. So a lot of what you're talking about there, indigenous people are doing it themselves. You know, they're not necessarily relying on the state to, to do it. They realize that their own languages and their own ways of life and their own land-based activities are actually what keeps them going. Is it what makes them unique as, as, as a people? And they're, they're often doing it themselves. But in some circumstances, it's very difficult because these, these ways of life and these cultures are suppressed. How are we doing for the time? Okay, okay. so I've been told with, with this kind of a symbol that we're just about out of time. Um, I'll, I'll just leave with one comment that Paul Hunt sent in, and I think this is just for people to think about. He asks uh, what the global human rights movement can do, either big or small, about these situations. So that may be something uh, for everybody to, to think about. And I'm going to hand over is it to Jude. Uh, okay, um, thank you for everyone listening to your meaningful questions. And um, yeah, thanks for the thanks for calling I, Myra and Rodi for your um, thoughtful answers. Um, so time flies so fast. We <laughs> it's a time that uh, we are going to move to closing, there's actually so much to talk about, but um, unfortunately, um, oh, unfortunately, it's um time to say goodbye. Um, actually, uh, I just wanted to um, notify everyone on one thing here. So after, so now we're gonna kind of do the official closing. But uh, since, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have a video um presentation prepared from um. Maru, who is from um, Rohingya Myanmar, Myanmar. So like, so like, as like an after event um thing, after event um presentation, we will play the video. Um, you are if you um the original conference conference was planned until twelve noon. So if you have to leave now, you can leave. But if you want to stay, um, you uh you can be with us and play and watch the watch our presentation together. Um, so at this more moment, uh, we would like to have some closing remarks from Julius Bueno de Mesquita, a senior lecturer of Essex Law School. She is also the new director of Human Rights Center. Jude, please give us a final word. Can you hear me okay? Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so thank you very much, um, everyone, for inviting me to close this conference today. Um, I'd like to make a number of remarks. Um, and, and first, I'd like to just make a few personal remarks. Um, so my own academic life started off um, studying history as an undergraduate, um, and I took courses which were called things like the West Under Rest, 
War and Nationalism on the Asian Front and Indian History from the 1850s to the present day. So you can kind of see where my interests were. Uh, but I was studying in a country, this country, in a university, in this country which has its own colonizing history. Um, and Colin mentioned earlier about the fallacy of decolonization in terms of one country handing over to control to others. But I also wish to acknowledge and emphasize the tremendous ongoing legacies um, of this country's colonial past um, and its ongoing neo-colonialism uh, in terms of inequalities, um, injustices and human rights abuses around the world today, including in Asia. Um, so turning to, to this event, this year's conference focus theme, Colonial Legacies and Modern Injustices, has an important part actually in the story. Um, it has play, it plays an important story in the broader uh, context of our conferences over the years um, on human rights in Asia. Um, and in fact, colonial legacies underpin many human rights issues across Asia, um, whether in terms of marginalization or repression of particular population groups, as we've heard a lot about today. Um, and also in terms of uh, perpetual colonialism, again, which we've heard about today, and neo-colonialism, again, a theme today. Equally, equally, we see legacies in terms of um, activism um, across the continent um, in addressing injustices, including the tremendous activism from our three panel speakers today. Um, and um, colonial, these colonial legacies under, underpin, um, in many ways, a number of other themes that have been addressed uh, by the Human Rights in Asia conference in, in recent years. For example, the garment industry uh, and questions of gen around gender and sexuality and economic development, to name just three. Um, so this year we've heard from three very distinguished speakers and activists, um, and I really like to thank them for their contributions um, and today and for their tireless activism um, in struggling for human rights. Um, so from Rode, we heard about the situation in West Papua, settler colonized, co colonialism, um, and how this has been facilitated uh, by the international community, by business interests, as well as by national governments. And it's rooting in, um, it's re how it's rooted in history and is perpetuated to this very day. A history um, and practice of displacement, population transfer, torture, killings, and destruction of way of life, culture, and the environment. Um, and we heard about struggles for self-determination, um, not just political, but also in terms of ways of life and the importance um, of fighting also for nature and the environment. From I, welcome back, I to Essex. It's really lovely to see you. Um, we heard about the history um, of annexation of Okinawa and how economic and military interests shape governments, governance at the detriment of rights to self-determination of local population and the rights to the environment, the right to health um, and right to information, as well as um, broader issues in terms of discrimination. And I think IU raised an important point in terms of how the lack of understanding of historical contexts uh, produces ongoing stigma and discrimination and underpins governance structures, power and marginalisation to the state. And Myra, thank you for your um, presentation in terms of the systematic um, and brutal suppression of the Uyghur population um, in, in from East Pakistan or Xinjiang, as you mentioned, it is named, known today. Um, and um, your struggles for your peoples, all of you, um, and against this extreme suppression and human rights abuses are, are vital and they remind us of the importance of the human rights project which is often under attack today and why human rights standards were developed in the first place even if these standards are not perfect and we often face difficulties in using them to achieve meaningful change in the face of vested interests um, they are there to be used um, uh, in activism to, for empowerment and legitimizing claims as you mentioned i in your presentation and in, in many cases, in some cases, not necessarily in the struggles that you're, you're all engaged in, they do advance, advance uh, social justice. Um, thank you for raising awareness of your struggles with us today and your tireless work in fighting against oppression. We extend our support and solidarity to all that you do. Um, and finally, to close today, uh, I'd like to uh, return to thank our wonderful students um, who have organised this conference. Um, Genta, for your efforts in lead leading this initiative, um, and Sinai, for your 
uh, work with the students uh, across the years and this year in organising this conference. Uh, thank you also to Colin for moderating. Uh, and I think now I'm going to hand back to Genta. Yes. Thank you very much, um, Judith, for your closing remarks. So. Um... While, as I announced, they will, we will play the video uh, provided by Mar after this, this brings an official close to the 16th um, Human Rights in Asia Conference. Um, we are very grateful for your attendance today, and we would like to express your sincere appreciation to the speakers and moderator. Um, finally, I would uh, like to introduce the uh, conference team very quickly. Um, we were formed shortly after our term started, and we have worked to make this conference together to make this conference happen. Um, if everyone could show up and give a word to the audience, okay, ask. Okay, Lily, please. Well, um, thank you, Genta, for making the floor to us for the final comment. So uh, maybe on behalf of all the organizing committee, we'd like to thank you to spend the last minute with us until today. And um, thank you very much for the wonderful speaker and uh, Colin, the moderator, for making this happen. Um, yes, like Genta and Shade has previously shared, it is a shared project uh, that we have been preparing for the last five months. And um, yeah, we feel surreal and very touched and very emotional uh, today when it's actually happened. So once again, I just want to express my deepest gratitude to everyone. Uh, for joining our conference online and uh, making this happen. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, Charlie. Uh, I just want to say thank you for all the panelists and uh, Colin as a moderator, uh, all my friends who uh, organized this event and all the all the people who attended this. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Um, Hyunjae. Um, first of all, thank you for speakers and thank you for audiences for participating. It was great opportunity to be part of it, and I hope this conference goes on and on. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, Nuni. Uh, first of all, thank you to all the speakers. It was such an honor to have you guys like with us today, and uh, such an on like my honor to join this conference and working with such an amazing like colleagues. Thank you so much. Hey, okay, um, Song Yun. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you, speakers, for being with us. Uh, we hope this conference was useful for everyone, and we look forward to promote human rights in Asia and everyone. Thank you. Okay, um, Dewi. Yeah, thank you everyone uh, to the audience for taking the time um, to listen to um, the panelists. All of them were incredibly insightful presentations. Um, so thank you for enlightening us. And also um, thank you for your team because you all worked hard. Um, so thank you for making this happen. Okay, um, Aksa. Um, hi all, I would like to thank all of you, the panelists who joined in, the attendees who were present. So this is our slight um, effort from the University of Essex to do something about the human rights, something that we're all deeply passionate about. And we hope that this conference pushes everybody one step forward in that direction. Thank you. Okay, so um, this was the conference communities. Um, I hope you I really hope you enjoyed and get some insights about the colonial legacies and justice in Asia. Um, so one last request is that we kindly request you to um, fill the feedback form that we have provided in the chat se section. Your insights and suggestions will help us improve um, future conferences. So again, um, thank you once for all of your support in joining us today. Um, stay tuned to the event recap on our Human Rights Center YouTube channel. And um, we will also publish the report of this conference. So if you prefer text, you can check it. Follow us on our social media channels to hear about our conference and next year and other upcoming events from the Human Rights Center. So um, yeah, so we'll just, as a closing for now, have a lovely weekend. And oh, sorry, just, one more notification is that uh, this is an on-campus event. So for sorry for those who have joined overseas or outside, um, 
as a part of the conference, we will do a film screening event in University of Essex at Colchester. We will film a documentary called Demons in Paradise. It is also related to um, the colonial legacies in Sri Lanka, focusing on the Tamil minorities. Um, it's on next Thursday. So um, yeah, please check our socials and uh, mails, emails for the event. Thank you very much. So now um, we would like to start the uh, video presentation by Maru. If um, time allows, you're, you can stay to uh, watch, uh, be with us and watch the documentary together, watch the presentation together. strategy like uh, you already probably most of you already uh, know about that and and same for Burman society like you know and the British uh, colonies uh, they categorize the ethnic group based on the you know like location or you know and so that they are really easy to uh, manage or control and also it creates the new ethnic order and not like uh, you know pre-colonial uh, local, uh, you know, uh, social orders or something like that, and and also like uh, to be able to, uh, you know, like uh, uh, you know, govern uh, easily that they favor one group over another, and so basically that the majority women are, you know, like uh, how can I the less favor uh, get the less favor than other, you know, like Christian uh, ethnic groups or, you know, other small ethnic groups that they bring in. And so then mostly the native uh, groups are like, are you know, uh, they, they, they didn't get favor by the British colony. And because I think British colonies are afraid, uh, I mean, like in a way that, uh, you know, they worried that these local might be revolved again against uh, them and that's why they favor the group that they bring in and things like that. And also like this, uh, it caused the uh, ethnic polarization is like, you know, and as uh, the, the, the discriminated groups and they have the strong ethnic nationalism and things like that. And so it creates tension between the groups. And another one is that they also, uh, you know, established that special communal constituency in, back in 1897 for the, their legislative council. And then they selected member like, you know, and di from different groups and also that these places, you know, and these uh, councils become the you know a hotbed for the uh, ethnic debates and there are like even more more competition and you know attention and hatred towards each other and also like are uh, the the uh, you know like are recruited uh, ethnic minorities uh, in their you know these military controls and uh, over ethnic majorities and so the resentment towards the minority has really grown in the majority like a common group and also this uh, you know these uh, colonial treatment and the political interpretations by the, of the colonies are still like uh, a lot of uh, majority Burmese uh, have this these uh, you know like uh, these ideas and these interpretations still uh, present in the major Burman you know political actors and and the way that the, the, how they um, you know like mistreat the groups and things like that and also like you know and they are how uh how can i put it on like their hatred towards uh, each other is still very strong and still very uh, divided and also like this divide and rule uh, strategy has been successfully passed to the uh you know like uh, independence uh or like uh, bombing regimes and they effectively use this strategy you know uh, after like post-colonial period and so, uh, you know, like um, when we look at it, uh, that uh, during the pre-colonial era, that are uh, you know there is no such thing of you know like Myanmar, Obama, right? And it's like the kingdoms are fighting each other, and also they can divide in some way, and they can collaborate in another way. And mostly is that they collaborate on business activity, but like not uh, socially or culturally. And each kingdom uh, live with their own culture and the religious line, uh, religious re religions, and also like a uh, very unique to each other. And it's not necessarily that, you know, they accept the diversity or not, uh, things like that, right? And so uh, when it, it become the, uh, the one they become colonized, that it, it changed everything. And also that a lot of problems are raised uh, in this 
Well, so the Bauman society is uh, until even until now that uh, you know ethnicity or like. race and really region is very much how can I very important like uh, if you come to some area especially like a Rakhine state uh, that when you have the brown skin and big eyes and the, the first thing that they will ask you is uh yeah you know and what is your race what is your ethnicity and you know what religion that you uh, follow and you know this is very central based on that uh, they will they will decide you whether you are you know uh you know uh alien or i mean like outsider or insider and so it's it's you you can escape from that <laughs> and yeah and also like uh for the migration of labor and changes in the uh, ethnic composition it's like uh because the you know myanmar uh, or let's say that you know the this uh, Bamar is uh under the british indian um in British India, and there is a lot of migration ongoing by the colonial uh, sponsorship, and so it, it happened the same for like you know, and actually also share the you know uh, hatred towards the Rohingya by majority of the uh, you know Burman people. And another divide is that uh, during the World War II, and there is a huge divide between the ethnic groups. So, you know, most of the majority ethnic groups that uh, they see that World War II as an opportunity, you know, and for their uh, fight for uh, independence, and so they, uh, they 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 collaborate or fight you know on the side of japan and also the the you know the the other minority groups and also other some ethnic groups which are favored by the british colony uh fought for uh british and so what happened in rakhine state is, and also the Bama Bama is uh, like you know uh, rohingya fought for fought for uh British colony and they were very loyal royal to uh british colony because uh you know and they were kind of like uh, uh favored by the british uh than the uh, rakhine people and so the also the rakhine and Bamen fought for the japan and so uh they see that rohingya as a you know like our outsider or who are anti you know how can i independence uh the against the other other native groups and so yeah it, it's still like uh, shape the you know how the mistrust uh, against the Rohingya and see Rohingya as an you know like uh, someone uh, who don't share our pain or something like that and it's still like the, the very much the idea of, of you know like it's the same uh, in the Bahman minds and so yeah this is also caused another conflict and at that time of course that what happened is that the Rohingya fought for British and a lot of uh, Rakhine people, and not just for the, not that they, they didn't fought, uh, you know, like uh, Japan, and they also fought, uh, you know, the Rakhine people who supported the Japan, right? And so what happened is that, and they become like a lot of Rakhine people have to flee. to the southern part of the Rakhine and also a lot of Rohingya from southern Rakhine have to flee to the northern part of the uh you know like Rakhine and so it also like not just for the they fought for the war but they fought against each other and so there is also like the history of killing uh Rohingya and Rakhine between each other and so after the you know like uh, independence and that this uh you know because uh, the modern political movement is uh, re really emerged from the colonial experience and the first citizenship law that uh, the independence government and you know like uh, UNU government and that their citizenship law 1948 it recognized rohingya as a uh you know citizen of Bamar and they get uh you know chance for both voting and also that uh, you know and they even have four parliamentarians uh from Rohingya group and then like uh, that this government was you know uh like assassinated and also uh you know like uh, uh the 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 
then renewing let uh you know regime uh they they, they get the power uh after this uh, military coup in 1962 and then new win is ultra and then he really really seems like hate all the uh people who are you know have the, this chinese uh you know uh, Indi uh like descendants and indian descendant pakistani descendant they see them all are outsider and enemies and for the you know like economic uh the, you know like uh the rules of the country and and he really predicts and also impose a lot of ultra nationalist uh, policy and rules and but not just uh, he didn't mean bad to a uh, minority he was really uh you know like treated so badly to all the you know uh do even a lot of bombing you know let's say but in the policy that of course he he discriminated and you know marginalized and you know erased uh, groups and from the uh, they are like nationalists uh, nationalists of the uh, ethnic uh, groups or things like that and so it basically uh, exclude the Rohingya in everything, like uh, under the his nationalist, uh, you know, like 1982 citizenship law, and he marginalized Rohingya and also imposed uh, huge barriers for them to get the citizenship. And then, like he uh, announced a certain ethnic group as a native, and so it becomes like uh, before, you know, his government, it was like 147 ethnic groups were, you know, like are uh, how can I recognize and and it. And then uh, when uh, under this uh, new winter dictatorship, it became like 135 groups without consultation with any group. And then it just like, you know, deleted or removed some groups out of the list. And it becomes like all the people are, you know, like uh, they, they also uh, make the, this uh, hierarchy between the, you know, what is the Dayanda or let's say uh, in, indigenous and uh, the others are non-indigenous become like uh, just ordinary citizens and so it uh, basically uh, you know like uh, remove their uh, group rights and you know and political presentations and things like that so and uh, his very racist uh, citizenship law that Rohingya lose citizenship and it means that without the citizenship or you know and they, they are denied to get access to the best certificate or you know family registration or anything and you know basically everything and like so yeah and, and we lose uh you know uh everything with together with this uh losing citizenship and civic documentation and so that uh, there is the, also this movement restriction and be just specifically for Rohingya and also that they, he launched, uh, you know, like this uh, Nagamin operation uh, is the Dragon King operation just to wipe out the Rohingya uh, from Rakhine state. And so at that time, that uh, also the huge number of the Rohingya have to flee to Bangladesh and take refuge on that side. Then uh, some of them repatriated, but like and later then they have to also uh you know like run away from this area by boats and because uh, there is movement restriction and you know and a lot of human rights violations uh started uh from this uh you know like this 1962 uh military coup and so uh we have still like uh from this time and to until now we have still like deny uh like denial of health services education and business and we can't do anything and also like uh because we don't have this uh citizenship status or you know a civic documentation and we cannot uh, participate uh you know and also we cannot vote and there is this religious discriminations like we are not allowed to uh pray uh at the mosques and also that you know a lot of mosques has been destroyed and uh you know like and There is also systematic discrimination at every level of the state institution. And so after several uh, decades and the, the, the Rohingya group became very like, you know, vulnerable on, on, in so many
their traditionally owned lands uh, in so many areas in Rakhine, right? And so after each communal violence that Rohingya has been forced to live in the IDB until now that if you look at the central Rakhine state, you will see majority of Rohingya are not living on their own uh, traditional land and they are living in the IDPs and, and also in the northern Rakhine that after 2017, Uh, genocide that uh, most of the Rohingya cannot get back to their land and the Rohingya land were reshaped and the all the you know the, these uh, you know land were shaped into the uh, another structure and they destroy all the landmarks and then like they built uh, the new government housing and also that for Burman prisoner if they want to uh, you know live in Rakhine that they are pay some money and land and also the farm which are all owned by the Rohingya so that they shape the ethnography uh, of the or even like ethnography of the uh, Rohingya and also like and there are a lot of you know foreign investments and also it also are you know part of this uh, genocide and like because we can see that the the you know like after just after this uh, 2017 uh, thing genocide that the land has been uh, sold to the you know our investor and things like that and so yeah and the, these uh historical you know are uh uh, discriminations and you know and ethnic uh, polarization and also the other uh, things happening during the colonial era has uh, embedded uh, the, these uh, hatred against Rohingya in Myanmar and it's still ongoing and uh, also that 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 things have changed after this 2021 military coup and but uh, in Rakhine that the ethnic division between the Rakhine and Rohingya are pretty much are uh, the, the the you know the same and social cohesion is still a major problems and also and these days that Arakan army which represented Rakhine people are fought uh, the you know the military regime uh, the, the of male line and they occupy uh, the Arakan army occupy a lot of area right now and although the Arakan army seem progressive that they still are in you know and willing to accept the Rohingya identity and seeing that they this is a political movement of, uh, you know, like uh, trying to get their land or something. And so uh, the, 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 the same, I, I mean, like the trust between the Rohingya and majority Rakhines are still very little and, you know, and so uh, uh, even though if the Rakhine states have been, uh, you know, like have independent from the military coup and also military regime called SAC, uh, that the, the the future of the Rohingya is still very much unfattain. Yeah. Hey, um, so that was the uh, video recording from Tin Maru Rohingya feminist from Myanmar. Um, I would like to deeply thank you for those who remained even if we are all <laughs> way over time to um, see her words. Uh, we will also make sure that her um, recordings will also be um, uploaded on our Human Rights Center YouTube with the whole recording of our conference. Um, again, yes, um, thank you uh, for all of us to um, stay. Um, okay, so, and thank you, I, my, my Rat and Brody for remaining for even if it's over time. Um, it, do you, do you want to say like final, like goodbye to everybody? Maybe, um, okay. Um, Roddy? <laughs> uh, Just yeah. a short words will be fine. Thank you. I truly, truly appreciate and I want to say thank you in my language. Wa, wa, wa to each one of you. Thank you so much. As a person from the grassroots, to have a space in academic setting, it was a, a huge privilege. So once again, wa, wa, wa. Wow, that is very nice. Okay, um, I do you want to uh deliver some few few words? Yeah, um, I repeat what we Rode said. Thank you very much for organizing this event, and thank you very much for the speakers. Um, I think what you have presented have so much in common with what Okinawan people have been struggling for. For example, inferiority or the loss of the languages, 
and loss of the land, degradation of the nature. I think they, there's so much commonality between um, between us, us, I would say us. So yes, I, I, I've been very empowered by what you have what you have been doing, your activism and your presentation. So thank you very much. And it, it reminds me it reminds me of the importance of connecting uh, together with other regions. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, uh, Myra, would you like to give some words? Absolutely. Uh, joining words of Rodi and I. Um, so such conferences helped people uh, make connection, you know, and um, the issues where we, ha we hear more about other nations uh, suffering is not only us and the world, um, but it's um, we share the pain and uh, experience together. And uh, more of us, uh, so um, settings like um, uh, yours, it just helps. Um, and as Judy mentioned, so the more uh, needs to be done on the human rights, you know, people today will take something with them uh, and do work. And as uh, always, I say at the end, is that just raise awareness. If you don't know about the Uyghurs or other nations, speak to the, you know, reach the speakers, find out more details, uh, raise it uh, wherever you are. Um, and um, very little help make, um, so we'll make change anyway. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all three of you for your strong words. As, as, a, as a student um, studying in human rights, I'm pretty sure like all of like the students would like to be somehow like you. So like we all learned from you today. Um, yeah, and I think having this important, this conference was an opportunity to find the commonalities and form some some sort of solidarity, even if our workplaces are different. So, um, yeah, I think I hope we can stay healthy and strive together for better human rights in the world. Um, so, and for the um, everyone attending, again, thank you very much. So, this is a time we're finally closing the conference. Um, yeah, please follow the um SX HR CSX Human Rights on Instagram and Twitter and everything. Um, so this is a final goodbye and have a nice weekend.